cities lost in time. Nineveh, city of the solar eclipse. This city has captivated the imaginations of historians and myth makers alike. And what better time to explore this ancient city than be before this celestial event coming up tomorrow, April the 8th. So stay tuned for the FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. It is my great honor to be here once again with my friend and co-host Brian Reese to bring you another episode of Cities Lost in Time. Tonight, Nineveh, the city of the solar eclipse. How timely it is to be able to do this broadcast, and it is a documented fact that on June 15th, 763 BC, at the time that Jonah the prophet was preaching to Nineveh, that there was a total solar eclipse in Nineveh. This is not a coincidence. And we've already talked quite a bit about these things, but tonight we're going to peel that onion back even deeper. We're going to show connections in the past and in the present that are so eminently important for us to know. So that's what we're going to do. A big thank you to all of you that are joining us for the broadcast tonight. The chat's filling up and getting snappy. We I see new listeners that are here. If you're a first-time listener, a new listener, welcome to FOJC Radio, and uh, we appreciate you uh, being a part of this. And I'm going to begin by uh, reading a scripture and giving a little information about ancient Nineveh. And then Brian's going to take you there. Brian's going to show you some reconstructions of this uh, ancient city. And if this city existed on the earth right now, as it did in its heyday, it would be the number one tourist attraction on earth. I guarantee it. There's nothing in the cities today that in any way exceeds the marvelous grandeur of this ancient city. Now, in the scripture, in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh 
was an exceeding great city of three days journey. It took three days to go around the city. That's a big one. That's a big one. I want to read a little information here from Halley's Bible Handbook, and it describes the city like this. Nineveh proper was three miles long and one and a half miles wide. Greater Nineveh included Hala, 20 miles to the south, Horizbad, 10 miles to the north. The triangle formed by the Tigris and the Zab was included in the fortification of Nineveh. Greater Nineveh was about 30 miles long and 10 miles wide. It, it was a huge city. It was protected by five walls, three moats, built by the forced labor of unnumbered thousands of foreign captives. Jonah mentions 120,000 people, Jonah 4.11, suggest it might have had a population near a million. The inner city of Nineveh proper, about three miles long and one and a half miles wide, built at the junction of the Tigris and Kosa rivers, was protected by walls 100 feet high. Now, just take a breath and think about that, how high 100 feet is for a wall. That's amazing. And broad enough at the top to hold four chariots driven abreast eight miles in circuit. Now, this is amazing to have that many, that much walls around a city 100 feet high and to be able, they're a they're hundred feet high, they're eight miles long, and you can drive literally four chariots on the top. This, this was just so amazing that if this existed today, people would be coming from all over the earth just to see this. There's nothing that is uh, in any way approaches under the grandeur of this ancient city that we're talking about. Now, we're going to, to have Brian now. Brian's going to take us there. He's going to show us the reconstructions of this city and the marvelous grandeur of it as it would have looked in the days when Jonah went there to preach against it during this time of the solar eclipse. So, Brian, give us a good visual understanding of just exactly how this ancient city looked. Absolutely, David. Um, before I show the video it's about two minutes long roughly a little bit under two minutes uh it's a really good the artist did a fabulous job on the reconstruction of this ancient city so check this out folks i hope you enjoy it
Could you imagine the massive scale of this Nineveh, even this reconstruction of this 3D rendering? Could you imagine this in real life? And especially what Brother David just spoke about with the tall walls. I couldn't even imagine even trying to scale that today. You know, it's kind of ironic, David. They can't even build a wall now. You know what I'm talking about, but I don't want to say too much. But they can't even build a wall. So could you imagine this endeavor, in the, in the, especially with this reconstructed uh, CGI up here, this video here, but could you imagine putting that together? It would take billions and billions of dollars to reconstruct in this and put modern-day conveniences on it, David. What do, you, what do you think? Yeah, it is just stunning to imagine what this would have uh, been like, and I'm sure the artist's reconstruction doesn't even capture the total power and the beauty of this city. And it's just truly magnificent, and it washes away this concept that we are given repeatedly by our modern so-called educators of the backwardness of these people, that they were backward and that they were primitive. These people, uh, they were very sophisticated, and this city is uh, had the grandeur and the magnificence beyond even the cities that we have today. Now... We're going to go to the book of Genesis, and we're going to read a scripture here, and we're going to introduce a character to you that's going to be important throughout our study of this evening. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and he wrecked, and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar, out of that land went forth Asher. Now, the, the original center here was Babylon. Nimrod began building, and out of Babylon, where Nimrod was building, went forth Asher. Now, we're going to identify Asher as a fallen angel. Literally, we're going to see that Nineveh was built by a fallen seraphim, and that everything in the construction and layout of Nineveh is a precise counterfeit of that which this fallen seraphim saw in the third heaven. This is precisely what we're looking at, and we're going to see that Nineveh is the prototype for the last day's city of the beast that Rome was set up intentionally as a prototype of Nineveh, and the prophetic implications here just absolutely escalate off the chart. Now, we're going to look at some mounds. This is one of the most significant things about Nineveh. Nineveh is built on mounds, and we see here there's a mound here, it's called the Nebi Yanusov, and uh, we see the one, and that is one, and that is where, uh, I believe that is the one where they say that the tomb of Jonah is to this day, at this very spot. There, The next one here is the Kunyanjik, and uh, this is another one of the original mounds of Nineveh. And below that, we see the mounds of Korosbad, which is called the Mound of Nimrod. Now, this is by the area of the modern city of Mosul in the, the country of Iraq. And, of course, Mosul, for those of us that were following the news uh, during the war, Mosul came up a lot during the time of the war. Now, what there's just so many things here that are so significant, and Brian has been a great student of Indian mounds. He's got mounds in his area. There's mounds here, and the significance of mounds, what the Indians were doing, they were building Nimrod mounds. You know, they were building Nimrod mounds, and the significance of mounds as a signature of the uh, culture of the fallen ones cannot be underestimated. There's a book here called World Gnosis by Mark Pinkham, and I want to read 
from this book to help us understand the significance. And we're going to look. We showed you a picture of some of the mounds that Nineveh was built on. And we're going to be giving you a big picture of the significance of the mounds and the layout of Nineveh. Now, in this book on page 42, we learned this. Memphis, and we're speaking of Memphis, Egypt, was which was originally built on a mound that represented the primeval, primeval form of primal serpent path. So we've all seen this serpent mound over in Ohio. We've seen this and talked about it. We got a serpent mound within miles of where Brian lives. We've showed you footage of it. Now, Memphis, Egypt was built on a mound representing the serpent path when he emerged from the cosmic sea at the beginning of time. This symbolizes to the dark realm the very wellspring of their energy coming forth, their fallen entities that they worship that gives them their being and their substance and their power. And it says it is known as Haiku Patah, the mansion of Ka and Patah. The name of this mound city later evolved into the Greek name for the entire country. Haiku Patah thus became Egu Patah or Egypt. The very name of the country of Egypt, which is symbolized in the Bible as the that of the world and that which is ungodly, it comes from this serpent mound. That's the etymology of the very name of Egypt. Wow. Uh, going on, yeah, wow. Wow. Now going on here, you see, this is this is so important to understand. The significance not only of none of it, but the serpent mouth. Let, let me just give you another little, another little thing here. This is on page 44 of this book. In his manifestation of the serpent on the tree, Thoth Hermes, Garden of Eden, was Kahimanu, the capital city of the 15th Nome or province of Upper Egypt, that became known during the later Greek area as Hermopolis, or the city of Hermes. This is where the emerald tablets had their location. This is the basis of Egyptian Hermeticism, based upon the emerald tablets of Thoth. Now, and this city, it says, the early artistic renderings of this city by the Egyptian scribes portray it as the primal mound surrounded by the protective coil of the primal serpent. These ancient centers of the absolute movers and the shakers of the dark fallen civilization, this is built upon mounds, and these mounds were representative not only of the serpent, but of that serpent power that rises Brian, as someone that has one of these within miles of your house, what what does this mean to you? Well, it's all this information's uh it's something to chew on. It's very compelling and, and intriguing. Uh I can second everything that you just said, talking about the mounds in Iraq, the Nimrod mounds, and then these books here we're referencing. Um Every time that I look at this, and I'll bring up, since we're talking about celestial event, you know, especially for tomorrow, everybody's all hopped up for the April 8th, which I will not be participating myself, but I will be documenting it and just, you know, so-called looking at it. But other, other than that, standing on these mounds and stuff and getting back to that topic. So in my area, I'll just voice it again. It's interesting what Brother David just spoke about that they're still doing it the same exact narrative, especially in the 1900s. We take a prehistoric village, which they would call, you know, let's just say indigenous man, and they would call it Indian mounds, and they just say it's Indians. Yes, there is some cases just, just straight up Indian culture as far as the Indians, but there's another uh, way of looking at it too. There's 15 foot tall giants in these mounds. Well, it's interesting in my neck of the woods, not too far from the mound that David's referring to, the serpent mound, there's a army base. Well, let's just let's just go there. They built an army base around a prehistoric village with mounds. And to this day, Brother David and everybody in the audience, it still is there, and they still study it. 
in the the random chain of events that happened in the 1700s, when as far as agriculture, this place was a vibrant, vibrant hub for importing and exporting goods in this tribe, this prehistoric village, thrived for 200 plus years. Well, in the 1700s, it bellied up. I hate to use that terminology, but it basically went desolate. Well, lo and behold, you know, the 1900s come around. You're talking about World War One, World War Two, and then miraculously, we have a army base. But they did not touch, nor did they destroy. They have examined the soil. They're there's no way to growing anything in this prehistoric village, to, even to this day. So isn't it kind of interesting? There's mounds on the outskirts of this walled army base, and there's mounds inside the base. And it's almost very a huge correlation with what we're t- discussing tonight, David, with the Nimrod connection. And it's almost like somebody had some pre-knowledge to be able to pull these endeavors off. What do you think, David? Because I think they did... And I think, and based off the knowledge and the information that I've researched out, they knew darn well what they was doing, but they just slapped an Indian name on it, on everything. And then, you know what's so baffling? They didn't even get the tribe's names right in my area. They just threw something up that, you know, the tribe would exist out in the western of America. And it's kind of ironic that they do that, and they think that, you know, I guess nobody's going to see it. And speaking of, one more quick, and I'll give the floor back to you. Every time a mound gets excavated here, not too far from me, um, not too far, excuse me, not too far from my area, there was a basketball court, all this stuff. They always do this, the same old narrative. So they tore down a mound in 2022 and then they put a, literally a residential area over top of it. And they usually put a park over top of it. And I've voiced this on some other programs, but my point is, is what are we doing here? Are we paying uh, homage to the Nephilim in some shape, wicked form, because every time that I see this happen, there's a mound that has significant data that has a 12 to 15 footer that was excavated out of this mound. And then voila, voila, I hate to use that term, but while and behold, they put a recreational or a basketball court, baseball field, or somewhere where children go play. And I think that's nefarious, Brother David. What do you think? Well, what you've described to me here about the army base near your home. We've got a serpent mound. We have an army base. There are mounds inside of the the base, walls around it, mounds outside of the base. This is a precise reproduction of the pattern of Nineveh. Now, I'm going to read more from the Strong McClintock Encyclopedia in just a moment, but the the students of the the architecture and the archaeology of the city they connect the mounds with fortifications it says here in the strong mcclintock it says basakiha mounds where remains of the fortified enclosures may perhaps be traced there were specifically in Nineveh mounds by the fortified enclosures these you know these similarities are just too deep and too numerous not to discern here uh, a pattern that we have here now as we look at this event which has millions and millions of people of uh, looking at it and you know what a great time for the lord to speak to people's hearts and to use this sign and a wonder and there are people you know we might ask ourselves well what are the people that are in the new age that are into witchcraft what are they going to be doing during the solar eclipse and what some of them are going to be doing is they're going to be doing rituals to open in their own admission, dragon portals. Now, I want to read something here from a book. This is called Dragons and Serpents, Earth Mysteries in the Time of Change by Stefan Bronnell. And I want to read here from page 92 of this book. And it says here, and Mr. Bronnell is not a believer. Uh, he says, the date was set for June 10th, 2021 at the midday eclipse during a solar eclipse. The sun and the black moon jointly occupy the moon node. The northern or rising moon known is also known as the dragon's head. 
I began to feel the space distorting effects of a trance around the climax of the eclipse shortly before 1 p.m. I was able to make out a kind of golden rain. This is a uh, uh, it's an event for people that are into the new age. It is something by which they attempt to enter into other realms of consciousness to where they alter their state of consciousness and they begin to experience these things that are coming from the spiritual realm, which is not good. That is not what you want to do. You're opening yourself up unto the the working of dark powers. Goes on to say, in this way, all those participating in the shared ritual were now in a position to open dragon portals. As a result, more than 50 portals that I know of have been opened, marking a first step toward the target of 999 portals. So there are people out there that are working rituals during the eclipse to open dragon portals. Now, just what they think is going to happen when they open 999 portals, I don't know. But what I'm looking for and what I believe, uh, we don't know all what's going to happen on the solar eclipse tomorrow, but I absolutely firmly believe that entities are going to be released into this world that are not good. I think the spiritual craziness is going to escalate into a new level. I think this is going to be something that we're going to be able to see and realize very quickly. Wow, David. Can I interrupt you for one quick second? Yes, here? you sure can, sir. It just dawned on me. We did a program together talking about wizards and the emerald tablets because you mentioned the thoth earlier you remember the saturn book i think the misread record talking yes, about sir. the vapor canopy isn't it kind of oh, i love that book isn't it intriguing and something to document here because here we are come upon this event tomorrow you know there's a lot of speculation people talk about the 2017 event back in august of 20 uh 21 2020 or excuse me 2017 you know they're referring to uh that some people well for disclose you know just to comment here Nobody look at it without proper eyewear. I want to bring that, I want to emphasize that. But there is some people that have said they looked at it, right? And they could see like snake imagery, like ripples. And it almost looks like a vapor of some kind of effect. And I thought about quasi quanto. We talked about that in our first episode of Cities Lost in Time of Chichen Itza. You know, the snake imagery and everything. Here we are talking about the dragon serpent. I mean, what's up with that, David? But I wanted to really hone back in on the misread record and this vapor canopy, all the anomalies going on with the weather uh, weather anomalies there in all the local area, especially Illinois, all the areas where the totality, where the eclipse is coming. And it's kind of interesting that Karnak and Cairo and the totality all the way down on the western coast, I mean, the west side of me of Kentucky on the tip end here of Kentucky, you know, you got Illinois and all that. Isn't it, kind of, isn't it kind of strange, David? And what if, what if, just what if, with all the climate and everything and they're doing those storms, what if they're setting up for something diabolical? This is all hypothetical, just a hypothetical question. What do you think? And it made me think of Miss Red Record with the Saturn's rings and the vapor canopy. Yeah, and everything we see happening is a perversion of that which God laid down and their ability for weather manipulation, uh, earthquakes and things like this. It's a documented fact that these things are possible. And most certainly we've had, uh, we've went right here at the barn, the Puritan barn, from 70 degree weather plus 70 degree weather one day to sleet the next day. It's been crazy. It's been a roller coaster of temperature swings, of uh, spraying chemtrails in the air. It has really been uh, just profound what's going on here. And the people that don't know the Lord, some of them look at this as a time of a perfect storm. They have the understanding as above, so below, and they believe that the uh, powers in the second heaven and the second luminaries, they have a, they believe there's a physical and a spiritual effect here on earth from those second heaven luminaries. And a little bit into the mindset, something else that was just stunning to me. We've talked a lot about ley lines 
and they see this time as a time when the powers in the heaven exert forces upon the earth at a profound way that doesn't happen at any other time. Now, this book, I'll read again. Uh, I'll, sh I'll hold this up so you can see it. This is from uh, the Dragons and Serpents book by Mr. Bronnell. And they analyze a ley line. Now, I've never seen anything like this, but this is their understanding of what a ley line is. And they actually do a dry, drew a diagram of it. And we've talked about the vril and the aether and how that we believe that the real power source that was searched after by the, the ancient people that wrote the Vedic text and by uh, Mr. Tesla and by uh, the German scientists during World War II and before, they were out to control the force of the aether. Now, these people believe that not only is there a aether up in the upper atmosphere and beyond, but they believe that there's an aether within the earth. And they are trying to unite the power of the heavenly aether and the earth aether to create this time when there's the ultimate, they're going to get the most bang for their buck for their little devilish workings. Now, how they understand it, and I'll show you their understanding of the diagram of a ley line, they literally see a outer earth aether, they see a pulse zone that drives the energy of this ley line, and they see a fire aether coming out of the middle of this. Now, this is just amazing. This is what they believe they're doing. And you see what they're doing, they are connecting dark spiritual powers. But I'll just hold this up and hopefully to where uh, people can see this. But that's how they understand and diagram. Can you see it pretty good, Brian? And that's their understanding, but that's just amazing to me. And you see, they... They're approaching this in a very sophisticated way. They're not, uh, they have a very sophisticated, deliberate approach to their workings, and they're using the forces of the black arts to, to bring forth results. And I believe those results are going to be the release of entities into this world. Now, something that we've also talked about a lot, and it's, these things are not coincidental that also tomorrow CERN is going to be firing up. Now, Brian here has some slides about CERN, and he's going to show you uh, the even deeper possibilities. And, you know, we know also that is it was on April the 8th that Aleister Crowley brought IWAS through the dimensional door. You know, I mean, there's just too many things here. So, Brian, why don't you show some of the... Um, the slides there of CERN and of some of these other things, and these been talked about a lot. But I tell you what, the the coincidences that line up are just too much to uh, what it looks to me. This is an all out push for for the people of the dark world to bring entities through, and I think there's definitely going to be some. Yeah, I wanted to put. I wanted to. Uh make sure I corrected something. I put the wrong slide up there uh, briefly just then because I was uh, incorporating Aleister Crowley there, Brother David, because I was trying to stay with you. I think we did a good job of uh, speaking about that. But it's, was it 1904 when uh, Aleister Crowley, uh, when that ritual, was that, uh, is that correct, David? Was it Al Was it uh, 1904? 1904 is correct. I believe so. 1904. Yes, sir. So we got 120 years. Uh, so it's kind of ironic. 120, and you have April the 8th coming up, and then you have Aleister Crowley uh, doing his little ritualistic standpoint and whatever Stargate or portal that he opened up. This is a post I put on my Facebook. Uh, sorry, it's just off the cuff here, but I wanted to stay with the program. But this uh, this entity here is what Aleister Crowley was summoning. It's kind of weird how this all is correlating with the uh, nonsense with the APEP. So you have APEP, uh, the whole correlation with NASA, and they're talking about the Devil's Comet, and literally they have a patch, Eclipse rocket campaign, and they're supposedly shooting off three rockets uh, to study all this uh, strange things of the totality, the partialness of the moon and the sun pulling and, you know, going all in different directions. I think they've been working on this since 2023. They've been shooting off rockets in the last year. And then this year, they're going to complete their so-called mission. 
And uh, isn't it ironic that uh, CERN, you know, we can talk about the Abaddon and Apollyon in the bottomless pit. We can go into Revelation and have go down a big rabbit hole with that. But isn't it wild that in April the 8th, 2024, that'd be tomorrow, that they're supposed to be able to, to uh, they're going to reactivate, which there's a lot of speculation online. I've heard a lot of people say, well, didn't they, didn't they shut it down? Wasn't that shut down like literally a while ago? Well, I remember when they reactivated it, it was like a year or so ago, but now there's something else. I think they were looking for dark matter or something to that effect. But whatever it is, they're doing some nefarious things. And I think, Brother David, this is my opinion, because in 1904 with Aleister Crowley, I believe that he was at the forefront of pulling in and mastering, let's just say, the esoteric knowledge, the Thoth. You know, you mentioned the Emerald Tablets earlier, referring to the other book. Um, it's kind of, I think they had this ancient knowledge, and now they're able to replicate. And I'll just throw something out here. 1955, folks. 1955 CERN was in operation. So if you think about that, there was some shape or form that it was being used in some manner in 1955. And I thought the date was very uh, significant. You know, you hear a lot of, you know, Hollywood narratives and stuff like that. Back to the Future, stuff, all that all that uh, narrative. But one thing I will remember, in 2016, Brother David, they did a huge ritual. Do you remember they did the huge ritual? It went on for like eight and a half hours. There's that number yeah. eight again. <laughs> there's, that, there's that pesky number eight. They did this Gother Tunnel just yeah. ritual it went on it was so diabolical it was one of the most oh, i couldn't even disgusting. watch it it was just nefarious they had like i don't even there's certain things i can't say on here but the way they went about it they put baphomet outfits on people half well, well pretty, pretty much borderline naked so much nefarious so much blaspheming and literally this gother tunnel and i'm and i said even back in 2016 you got holly's high, high profile people that got flown into different countries what do you think is happening? And around that same time, they talk about the Hicks boson, the, the God particle and everything that they supposedly found. Isn't it kind of weird that they chose tomorrow for this event? And then you have NASA literally corresponding with some kind of nefarious thing in the airways. So we have this hydrogen collider that's like 350 uh, feet down the ground. It's a 17-mile circumference. They have a little tiny one. That is, I think it's called Atlas or Alice, if I'm not mistaken. There's like some type of program that it basically supercharges the collider. But here's one one thing that'll get you, David. In Tennessee, they have a collider, and I've I've looked into this. Did you know, everybody? As of 2014, 2014, I did a deep dive on particle accelerators. Particle accelerators can be on small scale, large scale. They can be in your car. OK, they counted, they basically counted, supposedly counted. There was 30,000 plus in our world in 2014. That's as far as I could keep up as far as the data that is presented. Could you imagine 10 years later what they have now? So it's kind of interesting that there's CERN is the main hub. They're supposed to be picking up one in China, different ones that correspond with each other. They have some in Illinois, David, in that kind of in that kind of strange. They have some they have one in Tennessee. Isn't that kind of yeah. strange? They have one in Texas, but they won't tell you about it. They won't tell you that it was closed down, supposedly, like in the 90s. They won't tell you that it was basically, let's just say, renamed and then used for other nefarious space programs. Hello, Space Force people out there. But there's my there's my rant. So if you're doing ritualistic stuff with Baphomet and this androgynous warship, April the 8th, there has to be a correlation with Aleister Crowley. You know, whatever time frame, these entities, you know, they're calling them UAPs, UFOs. Here on FOJC Radio, Sunday Night Live, on this ministry here, including all the other ministries that are associated with us, they're fallen angels. We look at it in the Genesis 6 narrative, yes. and it's so demonic. Absolutely. And they're fooling us. They're fooling us on all levels, and we need to repent, and we need to literally come back to the father we need to get our minds right because this stuff is not it looks really interesting technology wise and it looks like it's very captivating but it guess what like the tower of babel man's imagination there's nothing that he cannot do now right since the tower of babel they have that esoteric knowledge they have all that knowledge like brother day was talking about the thoth 
all that stuff is pre antediluvian pre Adamite. They have all these all this knowledge, and they're correlating it and and literally compiling it all into one facility in all these places. I wonder, you know, there's so many things that we're getting inundated with, but tomorrow, keep your head on a swivel. I'm not saying be in fear because I don't like to promote fear, but I think if we just be at peace and be in prayer, because these things, we cannot control them. If the nefarious, no weapons shall prosper. So, you know, if you feel like you need to pray, that's where I'm at. I feel like I need to pray Amen. and, and yeah. fast oh, and continue yeah. on the mission there. But CERN is nothing but a diabolical, nefarious, let's just say it, ancient way, but we put our rendition, we put our understanding on it. Man's interpretation, we took ancient knowledge and kind of replicated it with nuts and bolts, and it's nothing compared to what the angels have. Nothing compared to what the Father has. Nothing compared to what Jesus has. And they're this is a literally a counterfeit, but it's going to do something like opening Pandora, Pandora's box. So I'll give the floor back to you, Brother David. And what that means is that not only is CERN firing up tomorrow, which have already stated that part of their goal is to actually contact entities beyond our realm of existence. They've already said that. And here we see what we see so many times. We see science falsely so-called and the occult coming together. I mean, you've got the occult all over NASA, from Jack Parsons to the Freemasons. And so it is here. So not only is CERN going to be firing up, but who knows, even possibly other thousands more of these hydron colliders are going to be firing up. And it is for the purpose of opening portals. Now, what can we expect to see? I think we can see an increase in the crypto creatures. Uh, Brian put a, a short up on FOJC of the uh, this entity scene in a mall in Miami. We've got the face peelers in Peru. We're going to see an escalation of all kinds of crypto creatures from uh, our, our Bigfoot type creatures on down. We're going to see an increase in UFO sightings. We're going to see an increase in what people are calling uh, shadow people. All of these things are going to be escalating off the charts. People are going to have more demonic oppression. And this is the thing. If we're in Christ, we're good to go. But if we're not, people are going to be going postal, if you will. People are going to be losing it. And we're going to see our world descend into chaos where people are taken over by fallen powers. I mean, now, two two things um, real quick, Brother David. And I'll, I'll, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have to mention this. You go right ahead, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. I want to bring this up. Old computers, anybody that's, you know, throw a computer away and they think that that's not um, still active, what it is when they have these quantum computers, they still can inter interact with the old chips. I want to bring, I want to emphasize that. A lot of people don't know that. That's why we have these particle accelerators. They do some type of weird, I'm not, there's just weird organic material that goes along, but that's almost say for the sake of this video. Mm. And then real quick, David, we meant, we didn't get to, I failed to mention it. There's supposed to be a red heifer. Well, let's just say sacrifice. I want you to uh, comment on that real quick before we move forward in the program. But how much more crazier and strange can we get here? I mean, it's just bizarre world. Yeah, and, and the red heifer, as far as true spirituality, it's a total fraud. Uh, you know, the idea that we would want to in any way encourage the building of a temple where animal sacrifices will be sacrificed after Jesus Christ has offered his once for all sacrifice for sin, this is abomination. This is just absolute abomination. And ju this just shows the spiritual craziness that is all coming to consummation around this event. Now let's go back to Nimrod or to Nineveh, this old city lost in time. And I'm going to read something here from the strong McClintock. The title of this book is the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature by McClintock and Strong. And that is the same Mr. Strong that did Strong's Concordance. This is just the Cadillac of Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias. And it, it, it has here a map. This is actually a map. I'll hold this up. 
This is a map of the mounds of Nineveh, and it shows the layout of the mounds in Nineveh. How many mounds is it, David? How many mounds is there? Well, well, just take a guess. Mm -hmm. There are seven principal mound centers. Now, I'm going to read this from this encyclopedia. It says the the great mounds of Kunyunjik and Nebi Yunus. Nebi Yunus is where the tomb of Jonah is. There is the mounds of Nimrud and Athor. That's four. Khorzbad. Sharif Khan is six. And Selamiya. That is seven. Seven major mound centers. Now, why is that significant? That is significant because this is a prototype. It looks like this is a prototype of the army base by Brian's house. And it's also a prototype of the city of Rome, the city built upon seven hills. Nineveh is absolutely the prototype of the city of Rome. It is nothing coincidental that there, and and I mean, they're mound crazy here. There were seven big mound centers, and around them were little mounds. And around the outside walls, they had mounds for the fortifications. Because as we have said, these mounds signified to them the, the ascent of the serpent, you know, and the harnessing of the the earth aether and the bringing it together with the the aether above and they're all out i tell you they're all out from the the most sophisticated scientists at cern from all of the the little new age folks that are out there and they're they're trying to make this a portal opening event and i believe it will be and it's going to be something that uh, the people of god need to be ready spiritually for now, we'll read here from a commentary on the book of Revelation. This is from the Word Biblical Commentary Series by David Oon. And we'll read just a little bit here about uh, the city on seven hills. He says, the phrase seven hills or seven mountains was used during the late first century B.C. and after the first century A.D. and would be instantly recognizable as a metaphor for Rome. Roman writers use the term Mons, mountain, and Colus, hill, interchangeably when referring to the seven hills of Rome. Horus, who refers to the seven Coles, Tabilis refers to the seven Montes, and of course the Monte and the Mounds, and it goes on to say uh, that Kiranol and Viminol and used Mons of each of the other hill. And of course, this is where we get our word mound. So we're talking about um, the literally another mound city. And we can see, as we have seen, Nineveh, which was the city of the beast. It was the great city of the beast and in its time built. We're going to show you it was built by fallen seraphim. This design wasn't just something some clever person thought up, but it was an exact imitation we're going to show you of a the, the actual city of God in the third heaven. And it is so profound here that this city lost in time, Nineveh, is the actual prototype of the final city of the beast here, as we see it here manifested in Rome. Now, let's look at a book called, this is called the Handbook of Gods and Goddesses. And uh, this just has a tremendous amount of information in it. And we're going to read a little bit more, and we're going to learn some more about Nineveh and about the fallen entity. In Genesis 10, 8, uh, we read where Asher went forth to build Nineveh. And we're going to be seeing biblically and historically just who Asher was. It says here on page 34 of this book, Asher, the great god of the Assyrians and the city of the Assyrian capital. The Assyrian king, and you see sometimes Asher is used for the fallen entity, sometimes for the capital city, and sometimes for the nation, and always context is king. Now, it goes on to say, this is just too much. The Assyrian king 
was his chief priest and vicar on earth. So the king of Assyria was the vicar of Asher, which was built on seven cities, on, on the seven hills of Nineveh. So now the Pope is the vicar of Christ in Rome, the city built upon seven hills. Wow. Well, who'd have thought it? Who would have thought who'd it, David? Thought wow. It? You know, I mean, the, uh, you know, this is so far beyond the veil of even a possibility of a coincidence. There's a deliberate pattern, and this deliberate pattern is coming directly from the, the fallen ones at the highest level. Wow. Now, reading on here, this is under the entry of Inanna, and Inanna was, you know, we talk about the goddess of a thousand names. Inanna was the Sumerian name of the goddess. Istar was the Akkadian and Babylonian and Ishar was the Assyrian name of this goddess, which was worshipped here in Nineveh. It says, later she becomes the Levantine goddess Astarte in the Greek, Ashtoreth in the Bible, and earlier form of the Babylonian Ishtar was Estar, or Easter. Hmm. And we're going to see, and isn't it timely? Isn't it timely? We're going to see in all of this, even the time of this clips near the Passover season, there's a huge Passover connection with this that we're going to be uh, really detailing in more documentation, unmistakable, irrefutable Passover context. And right here, Easter, you know, and we've talked so much. We warn people over and over. We've done so many broadcasts warning people of the paganism and the idolatry of uh, the pagan holidays and how spiritually despicable is it when people color Ishtar eggs and they literally color these Ishtar eggs in uh, whether they know it or not, honoring this pagan goddess, bringing this paganism into the worship of God. It's absolute abomination absolute abomination taking the emphasis away from the biblical passover and putting upon this pagan rite of easter which is nothing but the machinations of the vicar of christ in rome who is following the prototype of the vicar of asher that was in babylon it, it is just so despicable it's one thing we see what began in Nineveh, propagated in Rome, but now is coming down into these assemblies of people that profess Christ. This should not be. Wow. This should not be. It's an abomination. It's idolatry. It ain't just, well, I think I'll do this. It's idolatry. It should be immediately repented of, and anybody that is uh, a part and encouraging any assembly doing this, you will be held responsible for the Most High God. This isn't playtime. You know, American religion is a, you you just uh, turn the dial, you can hear anything you want to hear. People that will justify you living in sin and abomination, but this isn't playtime. And playtime is just about over, my friends. The judgment of God is at the door. And people that are trying to sanctify uh, paganism and put the lipstick on this demonic pig, there's a payday coming. There's a payday coming. It's going to come swift and it's going to come hard. Wow, David. Um, not to backtrack, but I want to mention um, seven, the seven mounds, right? You're talking about seven mounds referring to this book yes, here. Yes, sir. Isn't it, yes, kind of, sir. isn't it kind of strange when we did our, our Hawara uh, Cities Lost in Time, we talked about and referred to that movie with the mummy, right? And they had the seven watchers that was watching yes. the mercury and everything that was encapsulated in the sarcophagus of the mummy, the lady, the female pharaoh, and uh, the female mummy, I mean, excuse me. And isn't it kind of interesting that there was seven the seven watchers, right? It's kind of interesting. They look like raw. They look like what well, they they look like uh, nu Anubis, I think. I think Anubis and other characters from Egyptian, um, as far as Egyptian narrative. What what do you think about that, David? There's a seven correlation going on here. What's going on with all yeah. this? What's going on, David? I call them spiritual signatures, and you see the um, recurring symbolic uh, coordinations. You see the the recurring um, numerical uh, similarities down through centuries. And I call them spiritual signatures to where, yeah, for those that have eyes to see, 
uh, there's definitely a relationship. All of these, um, all of these occurrences that might seem unrelated, uh, they're very much related. They very much are. Wow. And it's, it's, it, this is why we do these programs, to let people know and be aware of this ancient delusion they put us under. And they're still using it. And it's so strange that these entities still use the same. They refabricate it. They just, it's almost like, you know what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the, uh, nothing new under the sun. It's almost yeah. like they don't know what to do. And they just keep fooling people over generation after generation. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, they keep. You're right. No, and and there is there is nothing new under the sun. We'll have another one to drive that home right here. So what we got? We got this city lost in time, Nineveh, which is literally a tro- prototype of the end time beast city. The the spiritual force in Nineveh is reproduced to the T in Rome, and that spirit is now released into the non-Catholic churches here in America and all over the world. And the Catholic Church has stopped calling them Protestants. They call them non-Catholic because, no, who's protesting anymore? Uh, Bless his heart, Mr. Trump's spiritual advisor, uh, uh, Paula White, she runs to Rome to kiss the ring. Who's protesting? No, it's a race. They're knocking each other down to go to Rome to kiss the ring. So, you know, the the Protestants are gone. Now, they're not all gone. I'm protesting. You know, I'm protesting, but the voices are very few. Now, the spirit in Nineveh was released in Rome, released into these non-Catholic churches, which is released into our nation. Now, here's another. Uh, I'm reading still from this handbook of gods and goddesses of the ancient Near East, and I'm going to read something that was a part of the cult of this goddess, which now, you know, this is obviously uh, the BVM of Roman Catholicism. Uh, their Blessed Virgin Mary is not the Virgin of uh, the Mary the Bible, but it is just another extenuation of this goddess of a thousand names. Now it says here on page 144 of this book, cross-dressing was part of her cult. And she had the ability to alter a person's sex so that a man became a woman and vice versa. What are you going to say except woohoo? You know, my goodness, the uh, you just can't miss this, that this spirituality is being reproduced. You know, the city you lost in time, Nineveh, uh, is all over us here now. Uh, it says here one final thing. At Babylon, her temple was dedicated to Ishtar of the star, the goddess as Venus, which correlates the worship in of the planet Venus. Isaiah 14, 12, Halel bin Shahar, representative of Lucifer, son of Shakar, and also the planet Venus in the second heaven. And uh, that's what we're dealing with. And it's uh, these amazing parallels and similarities are beyond the pale. It calls us to a time of absolute spiritual preparation and dedication. Now, let's look at uh, Enoch chapter 24, verse 2 and 3. And I went beyond it and saw seven magnificent mountains, all differing each from the other, and the stones thereof were magnificent and beautiful, magnificent as a whole, of glorious appearance and fair exterior, three towards the east, one founded on the other, and three towards the south, one upon the other, and deep rough ravines, no one of which joined with any other. And the seventh mountain was in the midst of these, and it had excelled them in height, resembling the seat of a throne, and fragrant trees encircled the throne. Now, why did this fallen seraphim, Asher, decide to build the city of Nineveh on seven mounds? Because it is an imitation of the real city of God, where his throne is is everything that satan does is an imitation a perversion a ripoff and a fraud of the power and the authority and the beauty of the almighty god i agree 100 percent, david uh that that statement's so true so true brother david i i couldn't agree more and it's interesting that let's just say it genesis 6 narrative 
like mankind has picked up this knowledge and they're trying to catch up. They're trying to play, they're trying to play ball with the fallen entities, right? And they're trying to declare war on God, just like Nimrod did. And isn't it kind of interesting that they literally have, I think it's called a God killer weapon. It's like a plasma rifle. I done forgot the location on it. Isn't that crazy with the military application in behind it? What is going on, David? Well, they're getting ready for something. You know, there's dumb and there's dumb, and that is just dumb, dumb, dumb. But this is exactly what the what the Bible says in uh, in the Book of Revelation, uh, in chapter nineteen. Let me see if I can find the verse here real quick. Um, and it speaks literally of when Jesus returns, they're going to turn and they're going to try to kill him. Yeah, Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and on his army. Speaking of Jesus, when he literally turns and he's, returns on his white horse and they're trying to build a plasma rifle to kill him? Really? This is crazy. These people actually believe that uniting with Satan, that they can defeat God. Let me tell you what, they're not going to win. They're not going to win. And people that follow along with this agenda and this scenario, my goodness, it is not going to turn out well for you. They're scared. No, no they're, it is They're not. scared. That's why they have to run and try to... Uh let's just say upload themselves to a, let's just say robotic standpoint or transhumanism. They're scared. Yeah. They want to become yeah. like an Elohim. They want to become an angelic entity, half hybrid, right? It's, it's nefarious. Mm -hmm. They're looking for eternal life without God, uh, through transhumanism. And, and, you know, and I think a lot of these guys and certainly the ones at the top, they know they've gone too far. They have eternally damned themselves. There's a point at which uh, transhumanism, you know, and I can't help but notice as you see people, and especially a lot of the ladies that are on these news shows, uh, as they get older, they feel compelled to do the, uh, the plastic surgery and the Botox, and after a while, it becomes so noticeable and unnatural looking. It just really... Um, they just really should realize it doesn't look that attractive. It just really, really doesn't. And this is it. This is the transhumanist gospel. And they believe they've gone too far, so they might as well try to get a doggone gun and kill him because they're not going to make it over to the good side. So it's like they're all in, so they're going to do everything they can to fight against God. But on that last day when Jesus Christ returns, it's going to be game over. They don't have a chance. They're going to be absolutely smushed and uh, and put down. Now, let's go to the scripture. Job 38, 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bland bands of Orion? And the sweet influences of the Pleiades, this is like uh, the sweet song of the sirens that was so sweet and beautiful that it would lure the sailors to to their death on the rocks. It is it is evil is most enticing when it presents itself as something mm. sweet and beautiful. Mm. That beautiful side of evil, those sweet influences of the Pleiades and the bands of mm. Orion, those bands that go around people's minds that blind them wow. from seeing the truth and the understanding. Now, I really pray this way. I've prayed this way for several years, and I've taught this in spiritual warfare over and over, and I will literally play, pray to bind the sweet influences, the Pleiades, and to loose those bands of Orion that are on people's minds. This isn't in the Word of God just to take up space on paper. This is reality of the spiritual world, and this the, the Lord tells us this, that we can fight in spiritual warfare against these dark powers. Now, let's wow. look at how the dark side understands this. 
May now I, let's read. May I speak real yeah, quick? Sure, go right, right ahead, Brian. Absolutely. Well, yes, this, sir. In Job thirty-eight, thirty-one, with the sweet influence of Pleiades and the loose and the bands of Orion, Orion. Isn't it kind of interesting, David? I know that you probably know about this. In Skinwalker Ranch at the Mesa, there's there's hieroglyph. I mean, excuse me, petroglyphs on the rock formations at the Mesa that refer to the Pleiades and the Orion. They've depicted yes. it and able to translate it. Isn't that kind of isn't that kind of strange, brother David? You know, maybe. There's some kind of correlation there with, let's just say, earthquake activity or ley line narrative. You know, I just want to point that out. It's just the first thing I thought of when I read that verse. And it's absolutely not a coincidence. Now, I'll read a couple things from uh, The Secret Doctrine by Madame Blavatsky, and this will help us understand what they're doing. You see, targeted prayer. I believe in targeted prayer. When we can target prayer to... You know, Jesus said to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, why are you talking about all that occult stuff? Well, the reason why we do is that we can specifically target prayers to bring the devil's plans down. And we have had some success in that, in the battles that we have fought. Now, let's read from Madame Blavatsky here. This is volume one. And this is on page 434. This shows their understanding here. Now, she begins here, the mighty ones perform their great work. She's talking about the giants. And leave behind them everlasting monuments. She's talking here about attributing to the megalithic structures that we see all over the earth, she is attributing them to the work of the giants. And more than that, she says, the mighty ones perform their great works and leave behind them everlasting mon monuments to com commemorate their visit. Every time they penetrate within our Maophic veil atmosphere, says a commentary. Thus, we are taught that the pyramids were built under their direct supervision. When Duvara the then pole star was at his lowest culmination, and the Kritakika Pallades looked over his head. We're on the same meridian, but above to watch the work of the giants. So wh when the giants came down, there was a specific positioning of the Pleiades. Now, all over the earth, whether in the the people that once lived in Skin Watcher, Watcher Ranch, they selected the very places of the where they would worship and where they would live according to the as above, so below. And literally, I've seen maps out there in the West, right in the Skinwalker Ranch area, where the different sites like this correlated to constellations. You see, when the Pallades were in a certain relationship, these people built significant structures there and commemorated it at Skinwalker Ranch in the pyramids. This is the significance of the Pallades. The Pallades, when it's in a certain position, this is like a green light to go, go gadget. Now's our time. Believing that at specific times, this energy was at an optimate opportunity for them to do what they do. This is why we see what we do. It's not coincidental. And they tell you this. Um, something else Miss Blavatsky said. This is from volume 2, 549. Meanwhile, it is they, the seven rishis, who mark the time and the duration of events in our septenary life cycle. They are as mysterious as their supposed wives, the Pleiades. Now, just a little word of explanation. We see in the Vedic tradition, the seven rishis. We see in the Babylonian tradition, the seven apkalas. We see in the hermetic tradition of Egypt, the seven sages. All of these were purported to be, and what they were, they were Nephilim, these ancient entities that brought and taught wisdom to all of these ancient cultures. And I think we're talking about three different groups of seven. That would just be my, my humble opinion. But the Pleiades were the the wives of these Kretakia and uh, the, the Rishis, excuse me. And this is just like Brian said, this is the Genesis 6 scenario. 
fallen powers mating with human women. And there was a huge correlation to this, to the Pleiades in the second heaven, you see. Now, it goes on to say, um, of whom only one, she who hides, has proven virtuous. The Pleiades, Critikia, are the nurses of Katarika, the god of war, Mar the god of war, Mars of the Western pagan, who is called the commander of the celestial armies. In other words, the Pleiades is ground zero of the power center, where the absolute command of the dark realm goes out. That's why the Bible says, canst thou bind the Pleiades? And yes, we can. I don't know if Job understood the binding and loosing that would one day be taught by Christ and the spiritual authority that the Holy Spirit wants believers to awaken to, but yes, we can bind the Pleiades, and this would be a great time to do it tonight and tomorrow to pray to bind the Pleiades because the absolute hordes of hell are going to be unleashed in spiritual rituals, which are going to coordinate with scientific rituals, which is kind of like a satanic heyday. Now, we know what the Bible says. The Bible says the abyss is going to be open, and it's going to be all kinds of crazy here. But for those of us that know the Lord, that's why we're saying this right now. Because God's people can pray in spiritual warfare, we can position ourselves to be not only safe, but thriving and victorious in these times. We are here to be able to explain these times unto other people, and to people that don't know and understand what's going on, which is 99% of the people that go in and out of the church house, there's going to be people that are going to be taking their own lives. They're going to be losing despair and hope as they see this gross darkness cover the earth. But this is our time. This is our time for the remnant of Israel to rise and shine and to speak out loud and clear of the things of God and his great power. Now, in this book, I'm going to read something from the Gospel of the Stars by Joseph A. Seiss. And it talks about the constellation Orion. And it says here, and Mr. Seiss was a Christian man that wrote, I, I like this book, The Gospel of the Stars. And originally, they were made by God, by the way. And that when we look at the constellations, it gives us godly information, which like everything the devil does, he flips it into an absolute inversion and a perversion. And uh, that's why we got what we got. But let me read what Mr. Seiss, he wrote this book in the 1800s about the constellation Orion. And because of its great magnificence, the flatterers of conquerors like Nimrod and Napoleon selected it for the association with the names of these men. And from the most ancient antiquity, Orion has been associated with Nimrod, the great hunter. The figure, and this is talking about the constellation Orion, the figure is a giant hunter with a mighty club in his hand in the act of striking in his left the skin of a slain lion. And of course, to people in the dark realm, this would represent the Nimrod, or the final beast, clubbing to death the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I'll just hold up the drawing here of the constellation Orion as it is drawn to represent the great hunter here killing the lion that, that was associated with Nimrod. And I'll just hold that up there so you can get a little look at that to see just real clearly what we're talking about here. So, you know, when the Bible talks, when you're praying to loose the bands of Orion, you're praying to loose the bands of the beast off your loved one's minds. Because this, this spirit, which came from Nineveh, the city lost in time, this is pervading our whole earth. And this is the spirit of the culture that's taking over. We need to bind the Pleiades and loose these bands off of people's minds. Absolutely. That's where we must fight the fight. We must fight this fight upon our knees. And that's why we're doing this broadcast tonight, just to, not to just find out more factoids about what's going on, but to understand their significance and what the role. And David, amen to that.
this gospel of the stars here and this book, the first thing that it reminded of uh, the Ring of Brogard, it was a astronomer's dream. Uh, it's out it's out east of us in another country. But it was so interesting when you said Nimrod, the mighty hunter. You're talking about the constellations. Nimrod, you showed that picture there with the lion. I'm not making this up. There's a folklore out there with the Ring of Brogard. It talks about literally a giant that comes down, and it's a comet. But these other giants are <laughs> waiting around you guessed it there's a mound there's a there's literally a village there was a place for them to worship they was dancing it was called this dancing ritual and what's so interesting about it, this comet comes down and it stops and puts like an impression on the ground kind of ironic right that's what they went down in las vegas just last year you know that's a whole nother topic for the alien narrative but it made an impression on the ground they worshiped this other giant he was bigger in superior stature gilberim let's just go there you know it's more of a higher stature they worshiped this entity and the the comet the fiddling giant that come down was warning that these other giants that the sun was going to turn them into petrified stone david whoa so what is up with that so what happened that day I don't know, but it was around I think five thousand plus years ago. I think that's when that account was. But it's the Ring of Brogard, the comet, the you know the whole connection with the constellations and the giant narrative. What do you say about that, David? Because it's still to this day studied by astronomy. Astronomers and stuff are still studying this day to try to figure out what that place is. Well, each and every one of these places, whether the Ring of Brogard whether the Bernheim Forest, whether the uh, mounds right there around Richmond, Kentucky, whether the Serpent Mound in Ohio, all of these places are ancient worship centers that are retelling the story of Nineveh. They're retelling the story of Nineveh, the story of the Genesis 6 scenario, propagating that religion and that culture, and they do it with symbols. They do it with symbols that will transcend time, that will, to people with this understanding, this will speak to them throughout the ages because they understand the meaning of these symbols. Now, as to this very interesting thing, I find it very interesting that in this legend here in the Ring of Brogard, they thought about the sun turning them to stone. Now, I, I don't know what this alludes to, but I know what might allude to, and I think we might even have a scripture here that might correlate us. Might that be, you know, uh, I, I could just see ancient Nineveh, and I, I don't know. And like I say, it's a absolute documented fact that on June 15th, 763 B.C., there was a total eclipse in Nineveh that uh, right during the time of the preaching of Jonah the prophet. Now, I don't know if uh, perhaps, uh, and I'll, I'll just read the scripture in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle? Now, this would be about 120,000 people, and as we've already established, Nineveh probably had over a million uh, or even several million people in this area. But could this be talking about people that can't tell the right hand for the left? Could this be people that were struck blind from the eclipse? Could the people that were turned to stone by the sun in the legend of the Ring of Brogard, could this be people that were blinded? From the solar eclipse, can't tell your left hand for your right? I think it's certainly, it's at least a possibility. And there was one account that I read of a person, and I know for me, I'm not going to trust some glasses someone gives me my eyeballs to that. Uh, ain't going to do it. But there was one account I read of an individual that actually looked at the eclipse, and the crescent of the sun and the moon was literally burned on their retina. And I think this is what this could be talking about, the judgment of God. And I don't know, maybe this eclipse is going to be even much more harmful than the ones in the past. I don't know. But I think there's a, a high probability that that legend in the Ring of Brogard and this scripture in Jonah has to do with that very thing. 
Now, Brian's going to go to Google Earth, and Brian is going to show us now the path of this eclipse. And here again, we're going to see some um, similarities and points of coordination that are just absolutely beyond the pale of circumstance. So, Brian, uh, just do a little Google Earth for us, and let's see what we got going on here. As you can see, everybody on the screen here, this is going to be the direction of the eclipse for tomorrow on April the 8th. It's going to be going in through Texas. And as you can see here, I have Jonah, Texas marked on the map here. I think it's interesting, Brother David, you know, we're talking about Jonah here through this whole program. Literally, it's going to cross Jonah. And then here we go, speaking of Nineveh, Nineveh, Indiana, Indiana. Nineveh, Ohio, and then we're going out into uh, Maine. There's a lot of, there was a lot of, I'm going to clear something up. There was some things online where they're saying that this eclipse was taking, there's going to be like seven Ninevehs. I've heard that during uh, a lot of speculation the last month, but I can assure you the totality, the path of the Ninevehs, it's in Ohio and Indiana, but the Ninevehs are really close. There's some more Ninevehs, but there's one in Pennsylvania, but it's not in the actual path of the eclipse. So I just want to point that out. Isn't that interesting that I think they was saying seven Ninevehs, I think, Brother David. I think that's what I thought was the interesting part of yeah. it and the whole speculation part. But I wanted to clear that up here on FOJC Radio. Anybody out there that's, you know, getting bamboozled and fooled by certain people out there. But it's going to be Jonah, Texas, Nineveh, Indiana, Nineveh, Ohio. And right here in the St. Louis, right here in the Illinois, and the whole thing with Missouri and Kentucky, this is the location I was referring to earlier when me and Brother David did a Karnak City's Lost in Time. But isn't it kind of interesting? You have Little Egypt. You have Little Egypt and literally the Cairo and Karnak there, David. And it's kind of interesting. That's where the crossing from 2017, August the 21st, and then you have this April the 8th, 2024. Isn't it kind of wild that that's directly in that area? What do you think, David? It's crazy. Well... This is right on top of us, uh, right here at the Puritan Barn, right on top of us. And it is not, it was just supernaturally the way that John and I wound up here at the Puritan Barn. It was just the supernatural providence of God. And the fact that we are here during this time of this total eclipse, crying out for repentance like Jonah did of old, I do not believe and I know that that is not a coincidence. Amen, David. Now, is Ray Moore there on Google Earth? You you want to show Brian before well, we go on? You know, why not? Let's just do it. Why not uh, throw in some ley lines? David talked about that at the beginning of the program. Let's go and throw some ley lines out there, folks. I actually have a way to show ley lines. Let's just go there. Let's just see what's going on with the Ninevehs. Let's see what's going on with Jonah. Let's just throw it on here. So I'm going to put the, uh, there's a ton of ley lines here in Kentucky and obviously in, well, Indiana and everywhere. I mean, you can look, America's inundated with uh, ley lines. But let's zone in here on the Nineveh. Let's start, well, excuse me. Let's go to Nineveh on, uh, this one's Nineveh, Ohio. Forgive me for the mouse move there. So there's Nineveh. We literally have this ley line not too far from the Nineveh, Ohio, back down in uh, David's neck of the woods in Tell City. We have Nineveh. Literally, David, it's the same trajectory. It's pretty darn close. I can even give us some measurements there to kind of give everybody, uh, you know, precise miles on. And I think from basically looking at it, it's not even, it's like maybe 10 miles away from the ley line. So literally just 10 miles away from the one in Indianapolis, Indiana area region, it the same thing, I think, just bas basically by looking at it, it's a similar factor for Ohio. Isn't that kind of interesting, David? Uh, it's almost like eight miles from that ley line. There's 14 miles. And then Jonah, let's go to Jonah, Texas. Let's see what Jonah, Texas has to say over here. <laughs> Jonah, Texas, very similar setup, probably about 20 miles or more. Uh, let's just see here just for fun. Let's just throw it up here, kind of give everybody a little perspective. And, yeah, well, it's a little bit more than 20. Forgive me for my misspoke, but about 45. But I can assure you there's ley lines that I've researched a lot of this out when it comes to these sacred ley lines. 
Um, I've heard anywhere from 60 to 100 miles out that it would affect that area. And I thought that was way out. I thought, man, 60 to 100 miles from the direct path of a ley line, it would affect the region in that far out distance. I was like, man, because, you know, you have so many ley lines that are all over America. What do you think, David? I mean, this is kind of strange, kind of strange. Yeah, um, and it, this is just another layer of uh, what some people would might call coincidence, but it absolutely is not. And it, can you pull up the earthquake info for us now? I uh, sure just, can. Let's just look at that. And, you know, we talked this far about the rituals opening the dragon portals. We talked about CERN, uh, CERN starting up, which is directly related to opening portals. Uh, little Alistair bringing lamb through on April the 8th. And let's just look at something else here. Uh, the other night, uh, right after our broadcast, Sister Donna was popping up the old earthquake page and something I noticed right away. Uh, if you can throw that up, Brian, let's it's look. It's up right now, Brother David. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't see it. That's good. But the tremendous amount of earthquake activity we've had, and this is something last Saturday night I said on the ride, this is something I really expect to see. And this is certainly something we're seeing, and uh, this is just exponentially escalating. And our good friend Dan Badandi up there, he was a shaking and a quaking up there when that, uh, I think it was a 4.8 uh, hit up there in New Jersey, uh, shook the entire East Coast. And what really stood out to me is uh, you can show our folks the area there of the Mariana Trench. Uh, and there was a 6.2 and a cluster of earthquakes that has hit there in the Mariana Islands of the Mariana Trench. And what is significant about that is that this is the deepest part of the ocean. It's over seven miles deep there. Now, in the Bible, guess what book? Oh, yeah, the book of Jonah. In the book of Jonah, chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains to the bottoms of the mountains. And he's talking about the mountains under the bottom of the ocean. The earth with her bars was about me. Now that word bar in the Hebrew, it means a gate. It means literally the bar that you would put to shut a gate. Literally, Jonah Jonah died. He literally died. We, we did a teaching on this on our Friday night, FOJC, Jonah the prophet of the eclipse. Now, he literally went through a gate into the underworld that was at the bottom of the ocean. What do we see right now? Earthquakes. The biggest earthquake in the last uh, the last 48 hours, a 6.2 right on the Mariana Trench, the deepest place in the ocean. I believe this is absolutely uh, going to be, and I don't know whether this was from God or from man, you know, now they're absolutely, uh, it goes back to Tesla technology, the ability to pr produce earthquakes, earthquakes and weather manipulation. This is something that is an absolute reality that are capable of being done. But I see here the, the terrific uh, possibility of the opening of a gate from the, for, for entities to come through. And I think this could even most definitely be something that's deliberately being done with these people to to bring forth an entity there. Absolutely, David. I will say this. Um, first thing I thought of is the scalar energy we talked about. We talked about that on our mud floods program. And Antarctica has a lot of hidden technology. There's a lot of things that's being hush-hush, under the radar I mean, that's why they have that treaty down there, that peace treaty. And I think there's something going on here, especially with that specific ocean there where we was just talking about. There's something there's something nefarious upon our land. And I don't know what it is. I can only speculate, but I know that scalar energy is a thing. I know we discussed that about the mud flood and how they can literally just move, shift land, literally several feet with the type of energy weapons they have. It's crazy, yeah. David. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, and it's a reality. You know, it's an absolute reality. 
All right, let's get back to the greatest reality, the Word of God, and let's go to Scripture. And we're going to look at this entity, Asher, and we're going to get a clear understanding of just exactly uh, what this little critter is. Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to look at verses 24 and 25. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land. Now here, thank God for the King James Bible. It translates, and this is the same word in the Hebrew. This is number 804 in the Strong's in Hebrew. And as we establish that sometimes this word is translated as the entity, the Assyrian, sometimes it can be used as the capital city and sometimes as the nation. But we're talking about an entity here, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Now, a lot of people know that Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. The first part of Isaiah talks about Lucifer. The second part of Isaiah 14 talks about the Assyrian. Isaiah 14 is dedicated to unveiling and transmitting to us information about these two very important fallen entities. Now, we can identify even deeper here in the 29th verse just exactly what the Assyrian is. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now that word serpent, now we've heard that this evening, haven't we? The serpent mound, which was the basis of Memphis, which was the basis of uh, the, the ancient city of Nineveh, the basis of the city of Thoth Hermes. This serpent symbology is that of the Caesarean who built Nineveh. Now, this actually is the word serpent in the Hebrew is the word seraph or seraphim. We here have a definite identification of just what the Assyrian is. He's a fallen seraphim of the highest order. We have here the, the city of Nineveh being built by this fallen seraphim who was in the third heaven before he fell. That is why he was able to build the city of Nineveh as a representation of of the city of the Most High God, and why this has been used throughout time as a prototype of the city of the beast. Now, Isaiah chapter 10, we're going to see, we said before, that there's a huge Passover connection with this. There absolutely is. The timing of this eclipse is certainly uh, the Lord omnipotent reigneth. There's nothing coincidental about it. In Isaiah chapter 10, let's read verses 5 through 7. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. The Assyrian is the destroyer. He's the destroyer. He is the fallen seraphim. He is the, the avenging angel. And God has used this angel. We're going to show you when the seraphim was put into the abyss, and he has been released by God as a judgment from time to time. And we see, we, we looked at how the cities of Memphis and the city of Thoth, that was the basis of Thoth Hermes, was based 
upon the serpent mound representation. And here is this serpent entity, the fallen seraphim, the, the, the Assyrian. Now, we're going to see here the huge Passover connection. Now, let's look at this. Exodus 12, 23, for the Lord will pass through the land, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer. There he is. It's the Assyrian to come in under your houses to smite you. The, uh, the destroyer, when he was release, released as a judgment upon Egypt, was, was, which was built upon mounds dedicated to him, he this resulted in the death of every firstborn child in Egypt. Now, that's a pretty good thing to pull off, isn't it? To kill the firstborn child. And this just shows the power of this entity when it was released upon Egypt as judgment. And wow. we're going to see in the word of God, this is going to be released again. And this was Passover, my friends. This is the time and the season that we're coming into. The same Passover that has been perverted into the pagan Easter, honoring this very entity. Wow. Wow. Wake up, people. Wow. Wake up, churchgoers. Come on now. Wow. This isn't some playtime silly game. Now. Revelation 9-11, as I mentioned, it's not a coincidence to me that the greatest earthquake and the most powerful activity is in the Mariana Islands, in the Mariana Trench, where the deepest part of the ocean is, where Jonah, he spoke about going through the bars at the bottom of the sea, gates. There are gates there, the Bible, Jesus told us about the gates of hell, gates that literally enter into shell, uh, hell translating by Hades in the Greek, Shoal in the Hebrew. And let's read Revelation 9, 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Look up the word Ab Abaddon in the Hebrew. Look up the word Apollyon, the Greek. It means the destroyer. Just like the Assyrian was released to bring judgment upon Egypt, he will be released again. He is the entity in the abyss. And when I hear, you know, the abyss, it's in the, it's in the heart of the earth. And when I hear about CERN kicking open and earthquakes going off at the deepest part of the ocean, it makes me to know that the time is nigh, wow. that the time is nigh when we need to be on our faces before God because we are going to see the escalation of the dark spiritual realm to an extent that we have never seen. And it's crazy time out there right now, folks, and you know that. I don't have to tell you anything. It's crazy time, and it's going to get crazier yet. So absolutely, this is definitively what I'm looking for to happen tomorrow, a release in the spiritual realm that we must absolutely be prepared for, and what other physical manifestations that we're going to be seeing. We're just going to have to, to be awake and uh, ready for. Well, David... Speaking of crazy, right? So we mentioned this at the beginning of the program when we was talking about uh, the NASA mission and whatnot. Let's just talk about that real quick. You said the feather in uh, it was Isaiah ten five through seven. We talked about the feather serpent. Any kind of interesting, David? No joke. The program I mentioned earlier with APEP, but it's called a e Egyptian serpent deity, a nemesis of the sun god Ra, an alternative name. <laughs> For the same deity, Apophis, is given to the near Earth asteroid. This is this is what this is talk about here with NASA, the whole NASA mission. Oh my goodness. And the subject, the literally the subject of NASA's ongoing, this is an ongoing mission, Osiris Apex mission. That's exactly what the, <laughs> David, you can't make this stuff up. And it goes right along what we're talking about tonight. Uh, my goodness. And um and and of course we haven't even talked about the devil comet. No, you know, we, we got us a devil comet, you know. Um, you don't want to miss the devil comet. Yeah, it's 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 bizarre world. We we've 
it's literally a perfect storm, isn't it? Yeah. It's a perfect storm. And the Bible tells us the Lord is going to speak to us in signs and wonders. And I tell you what, there are things here that are in our face that we miss to our own destruction. Now I'm going to give you three more scriptures. And I'm going to give you three more scriptures about this fallen entity, the Assyrian, to help us understand the the antiquity of this entity and how that he was imprisoned by God and how he is literally released as an agent of judgment. You see, God's the ultimate power. You know, this guy is bound in the abyss until God lets him out for an instrument of judgment. You know, like they're going to kill Jesus with the plasma gun. I don't think they are. You know, don't look for that to happen. Um, in Ezekiel 31 and verse 3, it says, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with the shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Now, this is identified as being in the Garden of Eden. In the eighth verse of Ezekiel 31, the cedars in the Garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. And we've talked a lot about this tree symbolism, and uh, we've shown multiple examples of how the occult world portrays trees as living entities. We got it the Wizard of Oz, don't we? And it was, uh, I think it was the Lord of the Rings, if I'm not mistaken, Brian, that had these trees that that were alive and uh this is exactly what we're seeing represented here now in the 16th verse and it speaks of the fall of the assyrian just like it speaks of the fall of lucifer and of the fall of satan and oh yeah lucifer and satan are not the same entity we'll just throw that in for no extra charge there for you but in verse 16 of ezekiel 31 I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth in the deeper underground realms. Here we see the confinement of the Assyrian unto the the abyss, and he has been released periodically, like we have said, as an instrument of judgment. And Revelation 9-11, there we see when he's going to be cut loose again. And I believe, and this will be in the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, when things are going to get very, very dicey. Yes, it will. Well, Brian, we're coming to a close here, and uh, we're coming to uh, pretty much the culmination of the, the information we have had to present. What are your final thoughts here on the broadcast tonight? Well, I do have one more thought. There is a slide that we forgot to show. It was the oh, obelisk, did we? Oh. the, the uh, oh. Nimrod. The... Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you remember that. Go right ahead, Brian, and speak to that. Well, what we have here is a black obelisk of Nimrod. You know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting that uh, this goes along with, uh, you know, I hate to say it, especially with our stuff here in America. Uh, there's a lot of correlations and everything. Speaking of Osiris and all kinds of narratives with all that, you know, the o Osiris spirit and all those different things. And then we talked about NASA, but this this uh, black limestone that's what blows my mind. The black limestone. I've looked at a lot of things with black limestone, and this this is very significant, David. So if you want to comment too, please jump on in here. Uh, this place is uh, literally uh, where this is in a British museum in London. Uh, I thought that was interesting that they have this place here. But the black limestone is really significant, especially with my research. I've been looking at limestone, and David can't make this stuff up. Limestone is abundance all over the place with these ancient mounds. <laughs> and there's yeah. like all these battlefields have limestone. And I've looked at it and I said, what is this? And 
that's for another program, but there is a correlation, we'll just say blood and something else. And I thought that's for a whole other program in itself. But this place with this black limestone obelisk, I think it's very interesting. They have this uh, narrative. They talk about it was erected as a public monument in 825 B.C. In the time of civil war, that's what's so interesting, in the central square of Nimrod. It was discovered by archaeologist uh, Sir Austin Henry Laird in 1846 and is now, like I said a minute ago, in the British Museum. What I think is interesting about it is it's in the British Museum. It was found during a civil war, and uh, there's military applications that go along with that from, you know, let's just say whatever's the insignia and what's written on this thing. What if it has, you know, we talked about spiritual applications throughout this whole broadcast. What if there's stuff on there that we haven't been able to depict? And this is why there's so much significance. But the black limestone... I know I'm not really touching base on it too much, but I think there has to be a correlation, let's just say um, a battlefield to a certain extent. And I'll have to get into that for another program in itself. But what do you think, Brother David? It's very interesting. Well, in the county just to the east of us here at the Puritan Barn, there are huge limestone quarries, huge ones. Um, and uh, it's significant in so many ways. Um in the obelisk, the, it, 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 is, it is important, it's significant, not only in the shape, but in the color. In the ancient obelisk, which had crystals in them, and crystals are, they were the same components as that was used in the quartz, in the quantum computers. They were capable of storing information, uh, transmitting and storing energy and power. It was possible that the ancient obelisk and here again we're back to egypt and that they were used as a energy source a communications device or even as a weapon this is very much within the realm of scientific possibility and also the color of this obelisk that it is black you know this echoes the thought of the the black stone and the kaaba and this symbolism that we see in these megalithic structures that is uh, spiritually significant all over the earth. So, you know, we see here foundational things that come out of Nineveh, of uh, the, the tremendous significance of it. It is truly a city lost in time, and it has been our great honor to take this city lost in time and to show it unto all of you for the significance that it has and you talk about something that's you know downtown brown right now i guarantee you this is uh this is happening right now and literally it'll be happening tomorrow and we certainly want to make that uh, a time of prayer and it's our prayer that uh, you all are going to be safe and um you know with that brian uh I, I think we're about ready for our final thoughts here. Any final thoughts there, my friend? Well, I wanted to just tell everybody thank you for attending with us tonight. I know that uh, a lot of stuff here that has been presented tonight is, uh, if you're just now hearing about this stuff, it can kind of be a little bit shaky, but uh, I can assure you that we've tried our darndest to put out the best research that we could possibly do, and uh, and literally it's all about Jesus, all about the scriptures. So, uh you know, don't let this day tomorrow uh, give you fear and, uh, you know, cause stress and strain on you and just cause chaos. You know, who knows? April the 9th might come around, nothing happens. Let's, let's pray that nothing happens. That's what I, that's what my prayer is. But this program has been an epic broadcast, and I pray that everybody likes it. I pray that if you, uh, if you don't care to hit that like button and share this thing out here because it's the sixth episode it's our sixth episode of cities lost in time i cannot believe we're halfway to 10 and i can't wait to get to the 10th episode but uh david carico it is a blessing always to be doing this with you and thank you all for attending with us this evening and what a blessing it is and uh share this thing out and hit all the links in the description we appreciate it and subscribe to the fogc underground church and uh david i'll get the floor back to you well as brian said a big thank you to all of you uh, see new people in the chat, old people in the chat, old friends, new friends. If you're listening to FOJC for the first time, welcome. 
welcome. We thank you for uh, listening in to FOJC Radio. I want to say next Sunday night, Brian and I are going to be back right here. We're going to be bringing you a presentation that I guarantee you, you've never seen anything like it. It's going to be the animal apocalypse from the Book of Enoch. It's going to be coming in uh, 100 miles an hour, slinging hot sauce out of both windows, guarantee you. It'll be a blessing to you. And some more cutting-edge research and documentation. So with that, I just want to thank Brian so much. Uh, it's just such a blessing to work with Brian. It's such a blessing to have wonderful listeners like y'all that pray for us and support us. And uh, we're just going to say with that, God bless you all. And we're going to give you a big high five and good night until next Sunday night, 7 p.m. Central on FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. High five and good night, everybody, from FOJC Radio.